Well, why don't we begin? Um, I, I would like to do this intro again because I, I'm an individual investor like you. I've been to these things. I actually started, went to the Money Show like 25 years ago. So if I was in the audience, the first question I'd ask is why listen to this guy? Well, let me try to answer that briefly. When I graduated from Stanford in 81 with an MBA, I was blessed to have a successful entrepreneurial career. I started two companies after I graduated. I had started two companies before um, I went to uh, Stanford. So since then, I retired when I was uh, 39, 40. Um, I decided to manage my own money as opposed to giving it to somebody else. That's what I've done for 25 years. I have no clients. I don't, I'm not going to sell you a newsletter. I, I, you know, if you're kind enough to look through our book and buy the book, my son and I wrote that, it'd be great. The motivation for the book was to teach him about investing. It wasn't for me to write a book. So it worked out really well because he's 26 and he's VP of StockCharts.com, so things worked out well. I used to drag him to class when he was, when he was 10 years old, um, I, teaching classes at Bellevue College. I would drag him to these classes and he would sh show stuff to the classes. So it was, it was pretty, uh, a lot of fun. Um, when Stocks and Commodities Magazine did an interview with us last year, um, you know, a lot of people our age, with the exception of some of you, our big concern is how do we pass the investment baton to the next generation? You know, so my concern was not le what legacy I leave with my son, but what legacy I leave in my son, because he's going to have to manage uh, a lot of money. So um, the quote that I like here is, and, and I hope this doesn't sound too self-serving, but thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle, and the, the life of that candle will not be shortened. In other words, I'm hoping to light your candles and it doesn't take anything away from my investing. I'm happy to answer every question very candidly. Um, as I said, I don't want you as a client. Don't you ever call me at the office and I'm gonna try to reward you for being here on a Sunday afternoon at four o'clock. So um, what I've done, I'm gonna fly through these. We'll be very quick. I'm happy to talk afterwards. In your handout, you have, um, about half the slides, okay? So we're gonna, we're gonna fly through these very quickly. Basically, the stock market is all based on probabilities. And what we can do as investors is, let's say if we start at 50-50, we can goose those probabilities, and what I'm gonna show you today, we can goose them up to 75, 80%. My trading now is, yes, I lose about two every, two out of every 10 trades, but I lose very little, and when I make money, I generally make a lot more. So my point here is you need to have a, a process that's repeatable, that you understand why you're winning, but what we're gonna talk about today are all these 15 things that you can do to really goose your probabilities. Um, the other one is uh, I've been writing a blog with Grayson since 2012. It's free. You can go online, and um, they're they're under the same ten categories as our book is divided up into, which is what we talked about uh, yesterday. So, um, if you would like a little homework, um, you can go to our our website is stockmarketmastery.com/slash/money-show, and uh, this will all be there. Um, for you, at, and it's, it's free. So the first enhancer, we'll call it, is asset allocation. And this isn't my research, it's Wall Street academic research. 90% of your profitability is going to be determined by your asset allocation decisions. But it's not that sexy to go to a cocktail party and say, oh gosh, I'm, in, I'm investing in such and such an asset class. People want to hear, you know, are you investing in Amazon? Are you investing in Starbucks? They want to talk about individual stocks. But this is so, so important. At my age now and where I am, I'm more of an asset allocator than I am a stock picker, a mutual fund picker. So the fact is there is no one optimal 
asset allocation. Everybody is different. Their personality needs, their individual needs, their risk tolerance. Everybody is unique. And so I'm going to show you my, uh, my asset allocation, but it doesn't mean that it should be uh, you know, fit for you. What's the purpose of um, careful asset allocation? Is so that you can protect your assets through all the different market cycles. Now having said that, you have to understand that if you put all your money in uh, BTI, SPY, and a big uh, blue chip mutual fund, those things are all correlated. They're going to all behave the same. So when I talk about in our book, we, we came up with 59 asset classes. And that may not sound like a, a big um, achievement, but when you consider ETF.com, the website, has a couple thousand asset classes. Morningstar has a couple hundred asset classes. And Grayson and I winnowed it down to 59 asset classes and then calculated the correlations to the SPY, to the market. And so you have to sort of think of it as a buffet that you have to pick across the whole spectrum so that you're not uh, entirely uh, correlated. So the way it works, think of it as ne these Russian nesting dolls. We start with 59 asset classes. I'll show you my portfolio, which has 20 asset classes. Yours should be anywhere from 5 to 20. Then we use an approach called core and explore. The uh, core part is for safety. The explore part is for the growth. And then best of breed is an approach that I use because in 50% of the asset classes, ETFs are the best way to play it. The other 50%, I can show you mutual funds, no load mutual funds that kick ass. So am I allowed to say that? Probably not. OK. Um, here are the 59. You can look at them in the book. Here are the 59 asset classes. You can see that if you buy a large cap US fund, you're, you're totally related to the market. You have to buy across this whole spectrum, even down to the bottom, where you have a negative correlation. Here are the 20 asset classes that I personally invest in, with the except, and I use mutual funds and ETFs for all of these. This class here, uh, large cap growth stocks, that is what I buy and what I trade. This is a little dated because I'm using old, older slides. The second enhancer is something I call best of breed. Stock chart, I, I don't work for stock charts. I write a free blog for them. They, they have a little tool called perf charts where you can put as many as 12 different ticker symbols on one chart, and then you can play with the, the length of time. It's a fabulous, fabulous tool. Make that, write that down as one of your homework pieces to, uh, uh, to do that. So I already mentioned that um, I put, I maintain a perf chart for each of those asset classes. And uh, as I said, a blog that I wrote uh, a while ago, half of them are ETFs, the other half are no load mutual funds. So you don't have to go either passive 100% or, um, you know, the uh, active. You can mix. Here's an example, just one of the asset classes. This is mid cap stocks. This is a fund I've owned forever. It's a no-load mutual fund by a company called Prime Cap. Um, this is, the green line is the market, VTI. VTI is the total market, uh, Vanguard Total Index. You own every stock in the US. It's a, an ETF. The black line is the best ETF, JKG. So when you're looking, and these are the best mutual funds in this space. So the, one, the two things that you're answering by looking at this chart are, one, is this sector asset class outperforming the market? Yes. And is the black line an ETF? Do I choose the, the black line or do I choose the orange line? Well, the black line is an ETF that is a no-load mutual fund. For this asset class, what's the answer? Obviously, mid-cap funds, right? There are other, here's another uh, bucket of mine, biotech. Biotech, again, the green line is the market. These are the best mutual funds out there. This is XBI, the best ETF. Now, would you buy a mutual fund or an ETF for biotech? Obviously. So 
if you go through all the asset classes, and it's just coincidence, 50% of them are ETFs and the other 50% are, and, and the book will explain it. And Anyway, I, the blogs, if you look at my blogs, I, I go into great depth. The other thing you have to understand is correlations. I talked a little bit about correlations. Correlations are a risk reduction tool. That's what it is. Um, I love this. I, John McCain once said that uh, Russia is simply a gas station masquerading as a country. And a lot of people think, I had one student actually, this came out of a student, he said, well, I bought the S&P 500, I bought an international fund, I bought Russia, and then I bought uh, uh, West Texas crude. And I thought I'd be diversified. Well, does that look like diversification? Russia and oil move together. The correlation is one. And you can see that, can't you? So my point is, as uh, John McCain said, correlations aren't something you can do intuitively. Um, if you Google uh, stock market correlation calculators, you will find there, there are a number of, of them. S&P has one, uh, uh, BlackRock has one, there are a bunch of them. We used, when Grayson and I did our book, we used the BlackRock one because they think I'm a, a money manager. So they let me use their stuff. So correlations are, you have to decide whether, um, what kind of trader, investor you are. The longer investor you are, the longer correlation you're using, a 10-year uh, correlation. If you're more of a short-term trader, then you'd be using a one-year correlation. So you need to decide what your time frame is because that'll determine the correlation that you get. And correlations go from minus one to plus one. So that's a positive correlation, a negative correlation. And what you want is a nice assortment of everything. So here's, uh, you can see a little more clearly what those classes are. So I showed you biotech. You see biotech here is only about half of the market. So you're getting nice diversification. And personally, I believe 10 years from now, do you think biotech will have done some good stuff and might be worth a few bucks? Which company? No idea. Am I comfortable buying XBI? Yeah, because XBI owns a basket of the biggest biotech companies, so great. That's the, the way I, I approach it. So all my asset classes go across the whole. So imagine that this is a buffet. It's a big table, and you're given a plate, and you're taking some from here, some from here, some from here. You're putting together a nice, tasty assortment. Make sense? That's, that's what you should be doing. OK. This is my hot button costs. And this is a freebie, guys. This is money in your pocket. You just have to make an effort. Here are two guys, two brothers. They inherit the same amount of money, John and David. And John says, well, uh, you know, I've got this buddy of mine uh, who's a money manager. He's only going to charge me 1%. And uh, I'm going to have my money managed by him. Um, David says, no, no, I'll just do everything you do, but I'm not going to pay the 1%. Well. They start when they're 45, and when they're 85, the, the difference here is $450,000. That's that, just that 1%. So is it worthy of your time to be focused on costs? Absolutely. Go nuts. Morningstar did a study that actually showed you that if you, had, if you used one single criteria, the most important criteria is cost. So why do you think Vanguard's the biggest company, uh, investment company? Because they have the lowest costs. So uh, I mean, it's, and it varies by different asset classes. I'm standing in your way. You better move over there. You won't be able to see. Um, this is just a continuation. Here is a real life situation of a, uh, a stock that, a mutual fund that I've owned, mutual discovery fund. And I've owned it for 20 years, um, back when it was a no-load uh, fund. You could all, and then Franklin, I actually played hockey with the Franklin brothers. They bought, uh, one of them bought the Templeton Company, the other one bought Mutual Series. This, look at this difference, and they're exactly the same fund. The only difference, 
with this is that this flavor of the fund, the, the ratio of the costs are 1.96 versus 0.96. This has a 12B1 fee, and this also to add injury, insult to injury, has a 1% exit load. So the difference here on $10,000, if, if they both started at $10,000, this little difference here is $5,000 significant. I, stay afterwards, ask me what you want. I, I've got to keep it going. I'm sorry? Well, separated at birth, brother separated at birth. Here's an example of Vanguard small cap. This is an ETF, VB. It trades a million shares a day. You'll notice very low fees. The bid ask spread is very low. You can buy the Schwab, it's the same fees, but it doesn't trade as much, and so the, sh the spread's a little higher. You could go and buy the Invesco. This is the same thing. These are small caps. Notice that the expenses are much higher. It trades much less, only 29,000 shares a day, and look at the spreads, much, much higher. So this is just another example where you can pay attention to costs. I will tell you, Morningstar has a great, great function. Everybody should subscribe to Morningstar. The mutual funds, um, you can, under the purchase button, there's a little purchase button. It'll show you some funds have uh, American Balanced Fund, I think, has 18 different flavors, 18 different pricing strategies. So I would go look at that. If you have a money manager, go ask them, hey, why am I in this? Why don't you put me in this, which is much less costly, that, that kind of approach. Okay. Uh, this is something I call rational analysis. Um, I combined, when I started investing, I started out as a fundamentalist. I was focused on earnings, only earnings. But then as time went on, I've sort of blended the two. So this is, this is a, a very hot sports car. Um, it's, it's the Acura. It's a combination combustion and electric. You, if you just deal with investing in this arena, or just this arena, I call that stranded analysis. So what you want is rational analysis, where you're combining, uh, if you get the handout, the slides are in the handout, just pick up a handout. That's what I call rational analysis. And here's an example. This is the S&P 500. This is the index. The price is here. This represents earnings. So what you're doing is you're taking earnings and putting, you're visualizing them, right? You're taking them, instead of just looking at an earnings number or looking at a PE as just a number, you're putting them on one chart. So here you see that earnings are heading higher, 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 if, and, and so is the price. PEs are actually going down. If you go and click on this chart, I mean, you can do this on, free on stockcharts.com. If you put this information in stock charts and you click it out to uh, 30 years, there's a perfect correlation between earnings and the market. It's a perfect correlation. The market does not go up when earnings start to head down. Try it for yourself. Anyway, this is what I call rational analysis, combining you know, the fundamentals and then you plot them and you can see what's happening, very powerful. You make money in the market by knowing what. Charts will tell you what's happening. You don't get paid for knowing why. I will trade out of a position, and I don't really know why I traded out of that position. I will find out three, four weeks, five weeks, months later. I don't get paid to know why but we're all so educated and so smart and we're trained as engineers and doctors and accountants. We wanna know why, don't we? We're trained to know why. Well, that's not how you make money. You make money by what's happening, react to that, and then worry about the why later. Does that make sense? It's, it's a little counterintuitive, but. The other approach is one I call telescope to microscope. We all have different trading time frames, and everybody in this room would have a different trading time frame. What you have to remember is that it really benefits you to step back and take a big picture and then 
even if you're trading a shorter time frame, step back and say, okay, what does this chart look like over, let's say, uh, 10 years? And then zoom in and say, okay, what, is, what does it look like over two years, over six months? And then if you're actually going to trade it, buy it or sell it, and this is uh, equities um, like ETFs or stocks, take a look. Stock charts, for example, and I'm not pitching stock charts, but stock charts offers you one minute data and they can cram 20 days of one minute data on one chart. So if you're about to buy or sell something, why not go and see what's happening, like what's really happening? So this telescope to microscope is a very powerful uh, example. Here's, we're looking at Johnson & Johnson. This is a 10-year chart. It gives you a certain perspective. If you go to a two-year chart, you get a very different perspective. You actually looks like it's in a short-term downtrend. Then you go to looking at six months and you say, well, oh, it's not really in a downtrend, it's going sideways. And then if you look at the last 20 days, this actually shows you that it's under accumulation. In other words, the big boys are buying it. You see all these big greens? That means that they're, they're actually accumulating. Number seven is something that I call permission to buy uh, checklist. This is and all of this thing that, that I'm talking about, I use stock charts. I've organized all my investing on these, what's called chart lists. Um, and you can actually, uh, on, on stock charts, if you, if you had a stock charts account, you can actually download my entire organization. I mean, Grayson and I built, built this thing. It's literally thousands of hours of our time. But you can download it and, and it magically appears in your, uh, so your organization is, exactly the same as ours. We have one chart list that answers these kinds of questions because if you know the answers to these kinds of questions, you've just goosed your probabilities. Probabilities of making money. The first question is, what's the market trend? The market can only do th three things. It either goes up, it goes sideways, or it goes down. Can't do anything else. So you answer that first question. Now you goose your probabilities by understanding is the market favoring large caps, mid caps, or small caps? You'll make more money in small caps if the market isn't enamored with small caps. If it's the other way around, you, you should know that. You should also know whether the market is enamored with growth stocks or value stocks. Over the last couple of years, the market hasn't been very interested in value stocks. It's been interested in growth stocks. You're rewarded for owning growth stocks. The other thing is uh, international versus U.S. Yes, U.S. is very strong right now, but it hasn't always been that way. And then breadth and volume are other things that we, uh, we look at very closely. Here's just an example of a chart list. A chart list is just, it's, it's a collection. This one's called, uh, GR stands for either Grayson Rose or Gaddis Rose. 10.1 um, is just, it's a collection of charts. Here are your ticker symbols. And you can see that I'm answering the question, what's the trend? And I'm looking at 10 years all the way down to 20 days. So very quickly, I can answer that question, what's the trend in the market? Allocation's the same thing. I'm, I'm answering those questions that I posed earlier. Enhancer number eight is something that I call the four pillars of profit, organization routines, uh, being able to replicate your successes and then discipline. Um, number one, organization, think of this as the big picture roadmap that you follow. How do you see the global markets is going to be determined by, uh, by the road that you travel? Think of this as your dashboard. So your organization is your dashboard. My chart list, that collection of chart lists, and uh, it's, it's actually, I think, what is it, Grayson, 96 chart lists? I think it's about 96 now. That's my dashboard. So I uh, think that's my organization. The other is um, routines. This is an inventory of my specific chart lists and how I review each of those on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis. It's sort of the agenda that I follow. Number three is investing is not like my 
mother-in-law drives a car bumper style until she hits something. Uh, that's not investing. Investing, you have to, to be able to replicate your success, you have to understand how you got there. So you have to um, be very consistent and very disciplined and be able to replicate it. And there, I'll show you some tools that we do that. The fourth is discipline. And I love this quote from the Dalai Lama, a disciplined mind leads to happiness, an undisciplined mind leads to suffering. Financial suffering, emotional suffering, all that sort of thing. My wife keeps asking me, why do you teach? My investment buddies that uh, say, why, why do you do this? I mean, you don't need to do this. Speaking in front of you, teaching at Bellevue College all these years helps me with my discipline. I'm, I'm probably one of the most disciplined people you'll, you'll ever meet. I mean, I, I ran track through, I represented Canada in, I, I mean, I'm Canadian. You may pick that up with the accent, but I'm a pretty disciplined guy. I'm sure my son will tell you that. But teaching makes me even more disciplined, and that makes me more profitable. It makes me happier. So, um, And then the cliche here that I used to use on Grayson when he was younger is you've got to do what you have to do before you can do what you want to do. So you got to go through your routines before you turn on CNBC and start listening to all that dribble, okay? Got to do that first. This is just a, an example of how, these are just collections of lists and, and, and this is what, what you would, if you wanted, you could download all these and, and you would know that it was ours because it's, it would have a GR. Yours would not have a GR so you could, uh, you could trash any of these. And, and it helps me with my asset allocation. I have one, this has all the asset classes. These are permission to buy my dashboard. I have it all very organized and it, it, it just really works nicely for me. Enhancer number nine is methodology. Again, we're talking about the consistency. It, occasional profitability without consistency is your, your, is, is just a lousy result. The worst thing that happened to me when I was 16, my first trade, I made a lot of money. That was like I thought I was, you know, God touched me and I was somehow special. And I realized soon after that I wasn't because I had no idea why I made money. So the whole thing about having a methodology is so that you can replicate it and understand how you're making uh, money. Profitable investing demands a unique type of methodical thinking. A methodical thinking creates the basis for your personal system. A profitable methodology requires consistency. You've got to write it down, rule number two. Don't forget rule number one. Sound like Warren Buffett? Yeah. You've got to write things down. That's, that's a really big, big deal. You can't just keep it in your head. This is my methodology, and how many of you have ever, ever heard of William O'Neill, who wrote uh, Investor's Business Daily? His methodology, his book sold a million copies. His methodology is called CanSlim. I've bootlegged CanSlim, and, and what I've done is I put it on steroids. This is CanSlim on steroids. So I'm looking for price, I buy strength. I'm looking for popular stocks that are just getting discovered, and I'll show you how I do that. Um, I'm looking for breakouts in, in price. I don't buy garbage. I don't buy bankrupt companies. I don't buy value companies. I don't buy companies on pullbacks, all sorts of things. So I'm looking for B for breakout in price. I'm looking for A is accumulation. I'm looking, and I have tools that, that I'll show you that show me when Mr. Market or Mr. Fidelity are accumulating stock I see that and I make a decision to jump in. I'm just an individual investor. I'm not gonna move the market. I buy a couple thousand shares, I'm not gonna move the market. So it's not like I'm, I'm managing a, a lot of money, um, like hundreds of millions. The technicals, I'm, I'm very focused on charts. I'm always asking what's the trend of the market. If the market's going down, I'm not buying, clearly. Leaders, I'm always looking for the best of the breed. So I identify who are, who are in that, and I'll show you that in a bit. I'm an earnings junkie because it, I've learned everything runs by earnings. If a company's making good earnings, 
you'll probably make a bunch of money and they're directly related. And then volume, I'm also a volume junkie because there's a big, big difference between a price of something going up on higher volume, more participation, versus a price that's going up on lower volume. Then your radar should go up and say, well, not interested. Enhancer number 10 is something that um, I, I, I like to get people to focus on. There, there are now hundreds, maybe thousands of different indicators. There's certainly millions of different methodologies. Uh, the metaphor I'm going to use is the fact that there are 6,000 visible stars to the naked eye, but sailors will tell you that there are only 58 stars that matter that are what they call navigational stars. The stock market is the same thing. You know, you can get distracted. The pool of indicators you can use is, is just wacko. You have to focus on only the essential indicators. Now, your definition may be different than mine, but this is my definition of essential. And I'm answering five key questions. Back to trend. I, I want to know what's the trend of the market. And I'm using trend lines, drawing trend lines. I'm using moving averages, which are nothing but mathematical trend lines, and something called ADX. Um, if, if you don't understand any of this, you can go, Stock Charts has a glossary that's fabulous. You just go and, and like, uh, one thing I'd love to give you homework, go look up on, on balance volume in the glossary. It, it's, it's the closest thing we as individual investors have to the holy grail, and I'll show you why. So the other thing I'm looking for is relative strength. Remember, I'm buying stocks that are, that are powerful, that are popular, that are strong, that, that are starting to get, be, be accumulated by the institutions. I'm not looking for stuff that's been beat down. So I, I'll show you that. Volume analysis, I have these two indicators I look for, um, whether it's under accumulation. Momentum is just straight physics. I use three indicators whether it starts to slow down. I mean, physics, you throw something up in the air before it reaches its apex, it starts to slow down. The stock market is the same on the upside and the downside, and these help me. When two of the three kick in, that's my indication. And then I use point and figure charts to calculate what my potential upside is in a stock versus where I'm putting my stop. So the first thing I, I do before I get into a position is I set my stop then I get into my position. This is something we call the Fantastic Four. As I said earlier, I do not try to catch falling knives. Uh, I'm not trying to catch bottoms. That's, that's not my style. Uh, but you should not be scared. In, William O'Neill talked about this a lot. You should not be scared buying strength because strong stocks get stronger. I remember my wife argued when I, when I was buying, or argued with me because um, when I was buying uh, Amazon at $100, she was saying, you know, that looks pretty extended to me. I, you know, I, and we have this deal that, so she doesn't go out and buy antiques for $100,000. If I really jump in to some equity with both feet, I go to her and say, honey, I'm going to jump in, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump in with both feet and I need a partnership on this. And I had to convince her on Amazon. Well, now you look back and say, yeah, at 100, Amazon was extended. Amazon now is my biggest position. And I, she actually said, look, let's take some money off the table. So I took a quarter million off the table and bought a sports car. <laughs> so um, anyway, so there are things like that that you, uh, you have to get over. This is the approach that Grayson and I use. This is the relative strength and how we identify what we're looking for. We're looking first for an uptrending market, then we're looking for the strongest sector. You know, the market's divided up into 11 sectors, big sectors. Healthcare is a sector, right? Utilities are a sector. Those are big sectors. Then each of those sectors, like healthcare, is divided up into industry groups. Healthcare, for example, pharmaceuticals is an industry group in healthcare. Biotech is an industry group in healthcare. There are about 12, 12 of them. 
So what you're looking, what we're looking for is a stock that's outperforming in an uptrending market. It's part of the strongest sector, and then it's the strongest industry in that sector. And then we're looking for a stock that's the strongest stock amongst its brothers and sisters in the strongest industry, in an uptrending sector, in an uptrending market. Do you think we just put the probabilities, the winds of probability at our back? Yes. Here's an example. All you have to do to make lots of money is remember my name. My name is Gaddis Rose. Okay. You go to stock charts and you pull down their chart style, Gaddis Rose, and you get this chart. So what this chart shows you is Tableau. The reason I'm showing you Tableau is when I took my company public, my ticker symbol was DATA, and Tableau bought my ticker symbol. So, of course, I'm talking 25 years ago. So it tickles me to see Tableau now purchased by Salesforce. Anyway, so follow along. You can do this with any ticker. And I think stock charts is the only, only place in the universe that you can do this. Mr. Money Manager, I need you to nod on this one and tell me that this makes sense. This shows you how data uh, uh, Tableau is doing relative to the market. The market in this case is VTI, the Vanguard Total Index. It's an ETF, right? Is that going up? Yes, it's trending up. That tells you that the first thing is Tableau is outperforming the market. Is that a good thing? Yeah. The sector Tableau is in is the uh, technology sector. Is that trending up of the, of the 11 sectors in the market? Is that outperforming the market? And it's trending up, isn't it? Is that a good thing? Yes. So the industry group that tab, uh, Tableau belongs to is the Dow Jones US Software Index um, industry group. How is that industry group doing relative to this sector? Because remember, sectors are made up of industry groups. You guys nod. Tell me you're, you're good. OK. So when you have a sector that's outperforming the market, and then you have an industry group that's the strongest industry group in that, then you compare the stock itself, which is Tableau, and say, how is Tableau doing relative to its brothers and sisters in that industry. You already know that industry is outperforming at the, the market and it's part of the strongest sector. So you can pull down, if you put in Amazon or Microsoft or whatever, and you, you remember my name, you get this chart. And so suddenly you've got these four wins. That's why we call them the fabulous four. You have the four wins of probability behind you. And this, in a nutshell, is how I've made a ton of money. And there's no place on the web other than us that stock charts. Now, it took me a long time to get them to program this so that it works that way. But does this make sense? It's important to me that you nod because you're important. Yes, that's just a, yeah, no, no, it's just a short, ignore that. But yeah, this, this is just uh, a few days. You see, it's a couple days. So enhancer number 12 is something I call the sister strategy. I should look at my time here so much. Um, I've been talking about this, the fact that the market um, is based on the law of groupings. Fish swim in schools, birds fly in flocks, humans belong to families. The stock market operates in groupings. Clearly, the, the previous example showed you that, didn't it? It you're, you're, depends on what market you're in, sector, industry group. That's, you are guilty by the company you keep. So here we have a situation where we buy, let's say we bought Johnson & Johnson. Well, you're not allowed to look at Johnson & Johnson just alone. You have to look at the whole family. Because for those of us that are married, you know you don't just marry this gorgeous little girl. You marry the mother-in-law, the father-in-law, the relatives, the cousins. You marry everybody. So that's why you're, you've got to track all the, the sector, the industry group, and then the brothers and sisters. You see Abbott, Bristol, Glaxo, Merck, Pfizer. 
those are all in the same family, right? Because when one family member gets a cold, usually everybody gets, gets sick. So that's the sister strategy. And that strategy is really powerful for, this is from our book, The Ten Stages. Whether you're stocking, whether you're actually buying, when you're monitoring, and when you're selling. For all four of those stages, it's really, really useful to stay on top of those uh, understanding the sister strategy. This is what I just talked about. Um, enhancer number 13 is the holy grail. So don't leave. Joe Granville in 1963 invented something that um, created, uh, you could plot buying and selling pressure. So uh, if you had the market traded up on that day, he basically added all the volume to the bucket. If, if it traded down on that day, he took the volume out of the bucket. And so it was showing you the bucket, whether the bucket is represented by a line, um, whether it's positive or negative flow, showed you whether there was really buying going on or selling. And I'll show you the power of this. When you apply it to end of day data, you're sort of generalizing, aren't you? You're saying, at the end of the day, we had an up day, we're taking all that volume. But it really worked. Back in 63, it was like, wow, this is fabulous. Watch this. Now, with stock charts, you can get minute-to-minute -minute data. It's free, guys. It's, I don't know why they don't charge for it, but it's free. And you can see now, this is on balance volume. Mr. Market is, is just, it's a fictitious gorilla that's buying all the stock, right? It's just a metaphor. So you can see now exactly what Mr. Market is doing, um, uh, whereas he used to sort of play games and you wouldn't really know whether he was either buying the stock or distributing the stock. But now we have x-ray vision because we can cram 20 days on one minute charts and we get these charts. Here's an example of Walgreens. This shows you Walgreens is going sideways. The price is going sideways. But what on balance volume shows you is that it's being accumulated. Mr. Market is actually buying more of this than selling. Here's another example the other way around. This is, I can't read the, the stock. It's actually being drummed down. But notice the price is being pushed down. But if you look at on balance volume and you're looking at every minute of trading, the big minutes are on up, on, uh, the big volumes are on upticks and the little volumes are on downticks. Here's an example of, of Grubhub, same thing happening. They beat it down, beat it down, beat it down, but it's actually being accumulated. What happens when they beat it down, when they've scared everybody out of their stock? Bingo, off she goes. This is an example of Facebook. Remember when Facebook had a, that big meltdown and gap down? This is the four days before. Facebook is making a series of higher highs, right? So you figured, yeah, it's still strong. But the smart money was getting out. Look at that. Big divergence. This is the holy grail for us individual investors. This will make you a lot of money. You should all be looking at this before you, you buy or sell anything. Um, enhancer number four is something called seasonality. Uh, this is a free indicator on stock charts as well. I think the chart is the easiest way to show you. Um, this is a, a five, looks back at five years. You can look, you pull this little thing, it'll go to six, seven, ten years. This is an ETF that shows you that over the last five years, this ETF has been up 100% of the time in February and March, and the average up has been 4%, the other one's 2%, and here again in December. Notice in July and April, it's been, uh, it's been up only 20% of the time, in other words, down 80% of the time, and it loses money. So if you're balancing your portfolio, why would you not sell here and buy here? I ain't cherry picking, so I thought I'd give you some big stocks. Microsoft and Apple, do you see any seasonality for Microsoft? Would this be a good time to sell Microsoft? Would that be a good month to buy Microsoft? How about Apple? Look at that. 100% of the time, it's up in these two months over the last five years. 
And this isn't just, this is uh, a sector fund. Look at that, 100% down to 25. This is a huge um, ETF, same thing. Actually never been up in November, always up in October. Mutual funds, this is a mutual fund that I've owned for a long time, the same thing. This is a country fund, same thing. Okay, free indicator, use it. It, it just puts money in your pocket, we're done. Last, last one is selling three peaks. When you see these three peaks, sell. This kind of stuff, you sell. Um, and then the reverse of what we did with our, um, you know, Fabulous Four, notice that it starts to underperform the market, the sector starts to fade, the industry group, it starts to underperform here, you sell it. Here's another example. I think I put some examples in your, in your handout. Um, it works on the upside and downside. So this quote from Charles Darwin is, guys, you got to be willing to change. That's the main thing. Change is the big thing. This is just, I put that in your handout as well. The roadmap again. Uh, this is my observation from having taught over 5,000 students. You've got to have a personalized investing methodology and you've got to have routines. Then you'll grow your portfolio. And I'm happy to stand up here and answer all sorts of questions. Come buy a book, whatever. And oh, and then uh, you can go to our website. And um, if you uh, add your name to the mailing list, then when, when Grayson and I do talks or whatever, um, we, we just let you know. And it's, the, the website's basically an educational website. It has a lot more detail on this. And our, our blog uh, is on there as well. And then uh, this, this was your homework. So you, you can go and read free blogs on all the little enhancers that we, that we talked about. That's it. All right. Thank you.